The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Evidence and Practicalities, Checkpoint Inhibition in Gastrointestinal Cancers, Translating Recent Advances in Gastric, Esophageal, and Colorectal Cancers. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash BJU860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello. Um, I'd really like to welcome everyone as you're finishing your dinner and enjoying your dessert. Um, it's a really a pleasure for us all to be here and talk to you about um, immunotherapy in GI cancers. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our other faculty. So Wells Messersmith uh, to my left here. He is a professor with tenure in the Department of Medicine, head of the Division of Medical Oncology, associate director of translational research, um, at the University of Colorado, um, and uh, you know, his actually the list goes on and on, but we actually have to finish the program today. Um, and then uh, to his left is Nilo for Azad. Uh, she is a director of Deve developmental therapeutics um, of the clinical trials program at Johns Hopkins um, Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. She's an associate professor of oncology, um, and then of course myself, Manish Shah. Um, I uh, had the solid tumor surface, and um, at, I'm at Wild Cornell Medical Center. So this is the agenda. Um, there's two master class lectures, one on immunotherapy and upper GI cancers, assessing the role of biomarkers and, the, and interpreting the complex clinical evidence in esophageal and gastric cancers. Um, master class two, Wells will talk about the state of the science of immunotherapy in lower GI malignancies, evaluating the relevant biomarker alignments and translating the latest data in colorectal cancer. And then we'll have a practicum where we'll talk about two or three cases. Um, we'll have discussion uh, questions and points, and then um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, about, about those cases or about anything that we've talked about. And then uh, Dr. Azad will talk about uh, new, uh, a view to the future, new directions and rational approaches to immunotherapies and combinations across different GI cancers and treatment settings. I think it's really critical because, you know, we're, we're really in a new era. Um, and how we improve immunotherapy, how we integrate it into our practice is really what I think will be the future for the next, you know, foreseeable future. And, and it's with that in mind that we develop this program. So I'll begin uh, by talking about upper GI malignancies and advances in immunotherapy, as well as the um, evaluation of biomarkers. Briefly, we'll talk about epidemiology and biology, and then we'll talk about immunotherapy. And I'll, I'll start with actually how it was developed, first and third line, second line, then first line care, and then we'll also talk about biomarkers as well. So, Gastric cancer, it used to be actually a top three disease in the United States, but that was about 50 or 60 years ago, before anybody here was in practice. Um, now it's relatively uncommon in the United States, it's number eight or so in the United States, but globally it's still a significant um, global problem. It's more prevalent in um, developing countries, uh, but there is a wide geographic variation in the United States. It's about 27,000 new diagnoses and 11,000 new deaths, um, and the, the prognosis remains poor. So despite the advances that we've had in lung cancer and colon cancer and breast cancer, um, you know, even with targeted therapies, most patients are living less than a year with metastatic disease. Um, in the last five years, we've really worked a lot in terms of trying to define molecular subtypes. So, you know, early on in, in my career, we were lumpers. We would treat esophagus and gastric together, squamous cell esophagus, adenocarcinoma esophagus, we'd treat it together. And we're really moving away from that era, um, and that's really highlighted by our understanding of the molecular phenotypes. So squamous cell cancer um, is the, the top bar there, and that's really uh, the molecular phenotype is no noted by the uh, CCND1 amplification and TP63. CIN uh, subtype, which is really the GE junction subtype, and also a lot of, about half of gastric cancer is associated with ERB2 amplification and VEGFA. 
Um, and then you see the EBV subtype, MSI high subtype, and the genomically stable subtype sort of moving down the line. Um, and each of these subtypes have characteristic mutations, and we are getting to an era where these mutations may have meaning, clinical meaning, for therapeutic implications. Um, and uh, in this slide, you can see sort of the variation across the stomach. So you can see um, that diffuse gastric cancer is prevalent throughout the stomach, both the antrum, the body, and the proximal area. It is associated with um, younger patients, and the incidence seems to be increasing a little bit. Um, the intestinal subtype is uh, really mixed by CIN and MSI high subtypes. And EBV, we don't see that much in the United States, but they do see that um, in Eastern Europe and Asia more prevalently. Um, our main focus will be Immuno, immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibition. And this cartoon, which is very simplified, um, really highlights the point that we wanted to try to make. So for all chemotherapy, essentially, the target is the orange cell, the tumor cell. Um, but for immunotherapy, the target is actually the interaction between um, either the tumor cell or an antigen-presenting cell and the T cell. Um, and, and essentially what happens with the T cells is that they integrate positive and negative signaling. Um, and so PD-1, PD-L1, that interaction, or the CTLA-4 interaction, um, or the LAG-3 interaction, provides a negative signal to the T cell. And the more negative signals the T cell has, um, the T cell will then be suppressed. It won't, it won't treat the antigen as a foreign um, antigen, and it won't attack it. So by blocking those negative signals with a PD-1 inhibitor, a PD-L1 inhibitor, or a CTLA-4 inhibitor, you can then shift the balance from a negative T cell suppressive phenotype to an activated T cell phenotype. And by doing that, you can then activate the T cell against the antigen, in this case, the tumor cell. So that's, you know, lots of work, a Nobel Prize in like 10 seconds. So the very first study was uh, that lo looked at immunotherapy and gastric cancer was actually Keynote 12. Um, it involved pembrolizumab. It's a humanized um, anti-PD-1 IG4 kappa monoclonal antibody, and it blocks the PD-1 interaction with its ligands, PD-L1 and PD-L2. Um, and so PD-L1 and PD-L2 are on tumor cells, antigen-presenting cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, things like that. Um, and PD-1 is on the T cell. Um, and in this study, um, we, it was divided by Asia and the rest of the world. About 35 patients were um, enrolled. And you can see, just with this immunotherapy agent, we had really substantial um, efficacy. The median overall survival was 11 months. So it was a clue that there's, there, you know, we're on to something. Um, the next study that came about was the Attraction 2 study. This is a gastric cancer third-line study of nivolumab versus best supportive care, or placebo. And this is in third-line or greater. It was unselected by PDL one status. It was a two-to-one randomization, and you can see the hazard ratio of 0.63. So it really highlights that there's a, you know, over a 30% benefit in terms of overall survival. Uh, improvement. So based on that, um, nivolumab is approved in Japan. Um, and here are some of the biomarker um, aspects of nivolumab. So this was done after, after that study was published. Um, so they looked at pd one expression in tumors, uh, less than one versus greater than or equal to one. Um, and you can see here that there was really no imbalance in the two arms there. They looked at tumor mutation burden um, at different ranges, low, less than five, or five to 10, or typically high to 10 or higher. Um, and then I looked at mismatch repair status. And we know, and we'll see some of this data later, tumors that are mismatch repair deficient or MSI high, these tumors are more likely to respond to immunotherapy. Um, let's see. So um, on the far right column, we see the impact on overall survival. And you can see that there wasn't one signal that suggested that there was, um, at least for PDL1 and, and TMB, um, at least with nivolumab. Keynote 59 was the next study that came about. And, and the first cohort is a third line cohort. It actually parallels um, the Attraction 2 study. After two lines of therapy in gastric cancer, 
um, they looked at the efficacy of pembrolizumab, and here they defined the biomarker, um, which is the combined positive score. So combined positive score, it, CPS, is um, a ratio. It's a ratio of the number of positive PDL1 staining cells, so tumor cells, lymphocytes, macrophages, over the total number of viable tumor cells. And you multiply that by 100. So, so anything one or higher um, is, is a positive score. Anything less than one, so zero, uh, would be a negative score. So on the left, you see a negative, no, no PDL1 staining. On the right, this is all brown, so this is like a score of 100. Um, we probably will never see that, uh, but um, uh, you, you know, pathologists, we ask pathologists sort of, you know, is this a hard thing? Like, how hard do you look at this? And actually, it's, it's easy to see that there's an occasional cell, either a tumor cell lymphocyte or something that's positive in a field of tumor cells. That, you know, so it's easy to find one. What's more challenging is, is actually the gradation. So like if you need to go to 10 or 20 or 15, to, you know, you, then you have to look at multiple high-powered fields to sort of know if, you're, if your uh, score is correct. Um, so um, in Keynote 59, this was a large study of 259 patients, and you can see the overall response rate of 11%. Um, and then on the right, you see the waterfall plot. And you can see that um, both PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative patients did respond. Um, the orange bars are PDL1 negative, uh, and the, and the uh, blue bars are PDL1 positive. Um, and you can see that there's a slight enrichment in so, um, the response rate. So 47% uh, of the patients had a reduction in their tumor volume if you're PDL1 positive, and 36 um, had a reduction if you're PDL1 negative. Um, and this is a swimmer's plot, so it tells you um, how long the patients were on therapy. And at the time that this um, study closed, we see a lot of people with arrows, meaning that they're still on study at the time of this being closed. And this is actually where you see a real difference between PDL1 positive and negative. The tumors that were PDL1 positive, the patients that had tumors that were PDL1 positive, they had a median duration of response of 16 months. It's quite substantially different than the PDL1 negative group of 6.9 months. So, based on these data, um, a CPS score of one or higher um, is now the indication for the use of pembrolizumab in the third line setting in the United States and um, in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, the other study in the third line setting that came out was Javelin 300. This was a study in the third line setting comparing Avelumab versus physician's choice. And unfortunately, this was a negative study. You may have heard about this earlier uh, in, the, in the day, um, but when compared to chemotherapy, there was no difference in outcome. There's a slight difference perhaps, um, uh, and at least in this study, there was no difference in the tail even. Um, so these are the, the top line con conclusions. Both pembrolizumab and nivolumab demonstrate promising an anti-tumor activity in the third line or greater um, setting. Uh, nivolumab demonstrated activity without selection for PDL1 status um, in a randomized setting. Keynote 59 demonstrated activity in PDL1 positive tumors. Uh, treatment was well tolerated, and pembrolizumab is now approved in the third line setting. Okay. So in second line, um, and I'm going to uh, go through these studies kind of quickly because these were negative studies. Um, so it's important to know that they were tested and, and the immunotherapy didn't work. So immunotherapy versus chemotherapy in the second line setting, pembrolizumab versus paclitaxel, um, and the top line data, median survival, nine months versus 8.3 months, hazard ratio 0.82, no difference in outcome. Now, this is an important part, again, regarding the biomarker. The middle, the middle um, Kappa-Meyer curve was the intent to treat population, CPS one or greater. Remember, this is the population that, for which pembrolizumab is approved in the third line setting. And you can see the, um, the yin-yang or the, the curve sort of crossing over. Um, so it suggests that chemotherapy has activity, more activity initially, um, but then um, those patients that respond to immunotherapy have a more prolonged benefit uh, later. Um, and, and that study was negative for superiority. If you look at um, CPS less than one, we see 
for the entire curve, chemotherapy is superior. So it's really key to know that you have to check CPS to know if you're going to use pembrolizumab. If you don't check CPS, you could be harming patients because they could be CPS zero, and if you give them pembrolizumab, they would be doing inferior compared to chemotherapy. And then CPS10, it enriches even further for activity. So, so the biomarker for pembrolizumab is really critical for its use. Um, in the first-line setting, um, it was a complicated design, uh, basically asking multiple questions. And to ask multiple questions, you have to actually kind of split the significance value. So this was a significance of 0.025, and you split that for three different questions. Um, so the first question that they looked at was actually pembrolizumab versus uh, chemotherapy, and they were looking for equivalence or non-inferiority. Um, and the way that you sort of look for equivalence is you look at the upper bound of the 95% confidence limit, and they set a threshold of non-equivalence of 1.2. The upper bound is 1.18, so technically this is a positive study. Um, but if you, if you look at it, you still see this crisscrossing curves. So initially, patients with chemotherapy did much better. But then later, patients who were on immunotherapy, those patients survived longer. Um, and I'm going to uh, go through this a little bit. So the CPS10, that's where you enrich for more activity. You still see the crisscross, but it happens earlier. So what it means is that the patients with who benefit from immunotherapy, there's more of them, and they benefit earlier. That's why the crisscross is a little bit earlier. Uh, but it still crosses. Um, and the, the key thing is that if you have immunotherapy, you have a 40% chance of, a, of living two years. So, you know, just five years ago, that really wasn't, you know, really wasn't possible. And so to see that now, we, we see that there is activity of immunotherapy even in the first-line setting. Uh, we just need to identify the right patients. Um, the progression-free survival highlights the fact that patients who are receiving immunotherapy uh, and who don't benefit, really, they progress really quite quickly. Um, and, and we don't want to do a detriment to our patients, um, for sure. Um, and this is the duration of response. So, uh, you know, patients with a, um, who receive immunotherapy, um, they have response rates of between 15 and 25 percent if you're pdl one CPS positive, either 1 or 10. Um, and the duration is quite, quite remarkable. If you look at the curve with CPS 10, the patients who received pembrolizumab and responded had a median duration of response of 19 months. It's remarkable. And then the um, orange bars are chemotherapy toxicity. The black bars are the immunotherapy toxicity. Immunotherapy is better tolerated. So if you can identify the patients that will respond, um, you're probably better off. Um, the Checkmate 649 is a first-line study that is ongoing. Um, actually, I think it just finished accrual. We're waiting on enough events to look at this question. It's a similar question of first-line chemotherapy with or without nivolumab. Um, and then we saw the, today's results of Javin 100, the idea of can we use immunotherapy in maintenance. And unfortunately, this was not a superior strategy to chemotherapy. Um, but I wanted to highlight the biomarker again. So if you look at PDL1 in uh, you, looking at the tumor cells, you see really no difference, no distinction between avelumab or chemotherapy. But if you look at um, looking at PDL1 in with a CPS score, looking at tumor cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes, you do begin to see a difference where Avelumab now has a median survival of 14.9 months. So, so I think that the biomarker for in these in gastric cancer really is critical. It's not just PDL1 standing on tumor cells, it's also on macrophages and lymphocytes and other cells within the tumor immune microenvironment. There are other phase three studies ongoing. 585 is a perioperative study of chemotherapy with and without pembrolizumab. Atta attraction five is an adjuvant nivolumab study um, versus um, S1 or KPOX. So we'll, we're, we're moving earlier and earlier in terms of treatment settings. 
Um, I'm going to spend just a minute on mismatch repair. We'll hear more about that later. But essentially, this is a critical pathway with regard to DNA repair. If you have a deficiency in that, you create more antigens. More antigens um, offer the immune system more opportunities to identify this as foreign and potentially um, react to it. Um, and you know, on the on the left, you see. Um, uh, colon cancer and gastric cancer is very high in terms of tumors that have a mismatch repair deficiency. Um, and in um, colon cancer, as well as uh, non-colorectal cancer, we see that there's significant efficacy of immunotherapy with um, mismatch repair deficient tumors. And based on that, for patients who are mismatch repair deficient, immunotherapy is approved, pembrolizumab is approved in the second line setting for gastric cancer and esophageal cancer. Um, and then other biomarkers. So this is a uh, study, a very nice study um, published in Nature Medicine by the Korean group that looked at uh, different biomarkers for efficacy. And we see CPS positive, that's all the brown, but we see other, other aspects. So EBV positive, six out of six patients responded, um, as well as the microsatellite high tumors. So. Um, that's an important biomarker for us. And then we have another question. Um, which of the following accurately describes um, the findings regarding survival of the benefit of PD-1 inhibitors versus chemotherapy in the second-line setting in esophageal cancer? So Keynote 180 was a third-line study in esophageal cancer, just uh, pembrolizumab by itself. Um, and we see some activity. Um, the blue bars are esophageal squamous cell cancer, the red bars are adenocarcinoma, and we see that there's an enrichment of blue bars on the right side. Um, and if you look at all patients, the, um, uh, and, then, and then you can look by histology, you can clearly see that squamous cell cancer seems to have more benefit than adenocarcinoma. We looked at pdl one status as well, and, and there seemed to be a little bit better benefit with CPS 10 or higher. Um, in the second line setting, pembrolizumab was compared to chemotherapy, um, dealer's choice for esophageal cancer. This included adenocarcinoma and squamous cell cancer. Um, and the top line results are shown here. On the left, it's PDL1 positive um, by CPS10 in esophageal cancer. And the p value there is 0.007. That was uh, pre specified as significantly positive. The squamous cell cancer uh, subgroup, regardless of PDL1 status, was technically negative. There is a suggestion. And then the intent to treat population you can see is negative as well. Um, so, based on that study um, and the Keynote 180, pembrolizumab is approved for CPS 10 or higher esophageal squamous cell cancer. That's the take home message. And that, that approval just happened in the last few months. Attraction 3 is a all-comer esophageal squamous cell cancer study, nivolumab versus chemotherapy, and it was significantly positive. Um, nivolumab is superior to chemotherapy um, in squamous cell cancer in the second-line setting. Um, and this is true across all different um, prognostic factors. And so these are the conclusions. Pembrolizumab and nivolumab demonstrate promising anti-tumor activity in previously treated patients with advanced metastatic esophageal squamous cell cancer. For pembrolizumab, the approval is for, it was positive for CPS10, um, and um, it's approved in the United States for CPS10 squamous cell only. For nivolumab, the study was positive irregardless of CPS or, or PDL1 status. So the last couple slides, uh, just summary slides. CPS status is important, is an important biomarker for pembrolizumab use. For gastric and G-junction tumor, it's one or higher. For esophageal squamous cell cancer, it's 10 or higher. Uh, mismatch repair is an important biomarker for upper GI cancers, uh, and it's approved after first-line therapy. Um, EBV status and tumor mutational burden, they are very suggestive biomarkers, but still exploratory at this point. Um, well, uh, Dr. Zad will talk about um, the impact of the tumor immune microenvironment and how we can maybe modify that. Um, the first line treatment for gastric cancer remains chemotherapy. Most people use a platinum and 5U doublet like Folfox. 
Um, triple, triple drug therapy, FLOT or modified DCF for high performance status patients. Um, for HER2 positive patients, um, we would add trastuzumab. In the second line setting, we have many options. Single agent chemotherapy. Most people use paclitaxel and um, For esophageal squamous cell cancer, if you're pd one positive with a CPS 10 or higher, you use um, pembrolizumab. In the third line setting, um, long surface approved, uh, another cytotoxic chemotherapy, or if you're CPS positive, one or higher, pembrolizumab. Perfect. So that's a high level run through of immunotherapy in upper GI cancers. And I'll hand it off to Dr. Messer Smith to talk about uh, lower GI malignancies. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll start with a case. So this is a, uh, and we purposely did this after dinner. We didn't want you to see this before dinner. Uh, but this is a right hemicolectomy uh, performed for a localized uh, colon tumor, you see here. And um, at the bottom of the slide, I've listed off the case. It's a moderately differentiated endocarcinoma, negative margins, no tumor deposits, T3N0, plenty of nodes were uh, taken. And um, the question is, uh, what types of molecular tests do we need to think about? And I put up here the NCCN guidelines uh, regarding mismatch repair, basically saying it really should be a, uh, a reflexive. But there's a lot of tests we could consider in a patient like this. All of you have uh, been reading about all the choices listed out here. So MSI testing really should be reflexive, and it's always uh, a little disappointing when I'm doing second opinions or something, and I'm looking at the PATH report and through the chart for someone who's been treated for a few years even, and there's no mismatch repair or MSI uh, testing. And you have to remember, stage 2 MSI high patients have better outcomes, really should not be treated, certainly without uh, with, uh, shouldn't be treated with 5-FU monotherapy. And then, of course, if someone relapses, you'd like to know um, what their MMR status are, uh, is. And finally, you might pick up Lynch syndrome, which could be one of the most important things you do in terms of having an impact on a large family. Um, it's estimated up to a million people you know, are walking around with some sort of familial um, syndrome. And I can tell you, we have a, a personalized medicine program at Colorado. We've tested um, upwards of 30,000 patients and picked up um, hundreds of patients who now need genetic counseling. So we've been hiring genetic counselors. Um, in, in NCCN guidelines for patients who are not appropriate for intensive therapy, this would be, of course, not on the label, but um, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors are listed for patients who are not fit for uh, chemotherapy. And then it's also per label and per guidelines to use in the second and third line setting. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the data that backs that up. Just a reminder, and uh, Dr. Shaw touched on some of this, but in terms of how do you get to a microcytal unstable tumor, um, you're really looking for, for germline, you're due to the mutations and what are the mismatch repair genes. Um, and of course, you have increased lifetime risk of all of the tumors you see there, and those patients need to be put on intensive surveillance and, and be put into high-risk clinics. More commonly, though, you have acquired MSI, most usually due to hypermethylation of MLH1, and you can actually test for methylation of the promoter. Uh, you can also have double somatic MSI caused by mutations in MMR genes. And of course, there's two methods for testing. Strictly speaking, if you say MSI, you're really referring to PCR-based testing or sequencing. And if you say mismatch repair, you're talking about immunohistochemistry. So in terms of immunohistic chemistry, you have the four antibodies there. And what you're looking for is a loss of staining in tumor cells and preserved staining in, uh, in normal cells. And what's the difference? Well, basically, the mismatch repair proteins, which is why if you're staining for them, it's called mismatch repair. Um, they're, they're basically trying to maintain the integrity of the DNA, and it tends to target alterations in short, repeated sequences, so-called microsatellites. And that's why a deficient MMR leads to uh, high microsatellite instability. Um, interestingly, we're actually, if you do PCR-based MSI testing, you're actually looking at loci that were chosen in 1997. And you're basically looking to see that you're going from a sharp peak to it spreading out to multiple peaks, showing that the length of the satellites is changing. And if you have zero unstable, your MSS, if it's one, it's MSI low, and if it's more than one, MSI high. Which one to use? Well, there really isn't a right answer here. I think the more important thing is you're doing, at least doing one of them. Neither of them is perfect. So 
in MMRIHC, you can have expression of the protein that is picked up with the antibody, but the protein might not be functional. Um, and MSI uh, PCR can also have a, a false negative rate. So they're not, neither method is perfect. They're generally complementary. If there's any doubt, we usually get both at our center, and the sensitivity is really dependent on what, uh, what genes are affected. What about using next generation sequencing? Um, and these are uh, four publications that uh, have looked at this and um, uh, have really set the stage in terms of using NGS. So this was the uh, Mantis platform, at, which found MSI in 3.8% of all cancers. Uh, this is why MSI testing has become reflexive in many different uh, tumor types. And you can see the Lynch syndrome tumors were the ones that were the most commonly affected, so endometrial, colon, gastric, rectal, et cetera. But there's a smattering of some of these other as well. Esophageal, Dr. Shaw talked about it's rare, but you will pick it up. Uh, cholangiocarcinoma, of course, uh, very important to do molecular testing in that disease subtype, HCC. In this particular case, uh, there, there were not any pancreatic adenocarcinomas, but there have been in others. And this was whole exome data from, uh, you know, over 11,000 uh, tumors. Interestingly, they looked at 2,530 microsatellite uh, regions, and ironically, only two were, were shared among the five that were chosen back in 1997. Uh, which is interesting. It's just really a bioinformatics thing. Um, it, this has been validated against PCR samples. Obviously, the Lynch syndrome tumors have the highest MS, uh, MSI high, and they didn't measure MLH1 hypermethylation, which is the most common cause. So if you, if you pick up deficient mismatch repair, chances are it's just somatic in the tumor. It's not inherited, but you, you definitely need to work it up. And obviously, colon more commonly than, uh, than rectal, and earlier stages more commonly than later stages. MSI sensor um, came from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, over 12,000 patients, slightly lower rate of MSI across multiple tumor types, about 1.8%, and they looked at 1,000 regions. The question often comes up, you know, how prognostic or predictive? We know it's predictive for checkpoint inhibitors, but what about a prognosis? Uh, if you're MSI high, and interestingly, across all tumor types, there really wasn't much of a difference, but in colorectal, MSI high patients do better. So the findings from this study, um, they looked at uh, multiple genes. As I said, there's very good concordance with PCR and immunistic chemistry. And um, the, the, there were more advanced cancers being tested in this set. That's probably why it's a little bit lower than the 3.8% we saw with the mantis. Um, and of course, GI cancers were the most common. Survival differences with col colorectal cancer were seen, but really not in other subtypes. Um, again, here is a, a dot plot basically um, looking at all of the microsatellites uh, evaluated. So for MSI testing, um, they're common in endometrial and GI cancers. It's reflexive testing for colon. If you see a colon cancer patient and it hasn't been done, really you should go back to your pathologist and ask to make sure that they do that. And it has implications for prognosis, for choosing adjuvant therapy. As I mentioned in stage two, 5 fu monotherapy has been associated with potentially with uh, lack of benefit or even harm. Um, of course, you can start to look at checkpoints if they developed advanced disease. Um, currently, um, and hopefully you guys have this open at your centers, um, the atomic trial looking at adjuvant use of a checkpoint inhibitor. And then, importantly, genetic counseling. These folks need to go to genetic counseling for germline testing um, to make sure that there isn't a familial syndrome. And you can have a huge impact on a family if you pick this up. NGS uh, assays appear to be very promising. There's high concordance and numerous published uh, bioinformatics platform. And so um, since most MSI high tumors are not associated with Lynch, really only about 10% or so, you really can't use family history as a guide to decide uh, when to order the test. And talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, initially when these were coming out, um, there was very little activity seen across uh, colon as compared to other tumor types. And I remember the GI meetings, we all sort of hung our heads because we were the ones who weren't sort of included in all these uh, incredible, uh, you know, results. And um, Checkmate 142, and I'll show some uh, permalizumab slides in a minute, looked at um, in MSI high or deficient mismatch repair tumors, Nevo versus Nevo IPI. And just as a reminder, the IPI is given for four doses, and then you go to Nevo monotherapy. So you don't keep it going uh, throughout four doses and then stop. And in this, the response rate was quite high, 55% uh, response rate um, in this trial. 
Uh, and that's compared with 34% with nivolumab monotherapy. So pretty impressive uh, response rate for the combination. What I thought was interesting about this trial is a couple things. So you've heard uh, all about PD-1, TPS, CPS, et cetera, from Dr. Shaw. Here, it really didn't make a difference, okay? It was roughly half and half, and it, it just did not make a difference in terms of the patients responding. The other thing I thought was very fascinating about this trial is that when you're BRAF uh, mutated, you often have hypermethylation of MLH1 and you have MSI high, and BRAF is known to be an aggressive subtype. And um, interestingly, in this study at least, BRAF was pretty much irrelevant. Whether you're BRAF positive or negative really didn't seem to matter. Those patients got a benefit. So when you think about um, having to use big combinations of all these pills and things uh, for those patients and the toxicities compared to being able to use immune therapy, it's, a, it's reassuring that we have that option. Looking at performance, to, uh, a PFS and OS, again, very impressive results. It, not common uh, for the first 15 years of my career to ever see a, a curve flatten in colorectal cancer. So, and of course, many of us have seen that in clinic where you're basically debating when should you stop. Uh, these patients are doing so well. Importantly, you know, I think one of the big advantages of, of immune therapy is really just the side effects. And, you saw the uh, graph that Dr. Shaw showed showing the, you know, the big differences. And finally, we have some uh, quality of life data here showing improved quality of life for patients on this. Of course, you do get um, side effects, and you see the grade three, four side effects. Fortunately, they're rare. They can be very tricky to manage uh, sometimes if they don't immediately respond to steroids. But um, fortunately, they are fairly rare to get to that grade three, four uh, uh, level. Uh, Dr. Shaw touched on this. If you look at pembrolizumab and say, well, why did pembrolizumab get the tumor agnostic uh, uh, approval by the FDA? It's really this slide here, We're just showing activity across multiple tumor types, many of which are associated with Lynch, but some aren't, and uh, just showing really nice activity. And if we look at Keynote 164, um, so this was um, uh, you know, good performance status patients, MSI high, and looking at uh, uh, third line setting or second line setting and above. And here, um, again, you have fairly good activity. We see these response rates of roughly 30% in, uh, in both cohorts and um, ex, uh, you know, fairly good overall survival progression free survival rates. And um, again, you see that kind of 20, 30% any adverse event and the less than 10% severe. What about tumor mutational burden? So this is more of an a, a emerging marker. Um, it was initially shown to be predictive in patients with melanoma, and then it's been now been shown in lung cancer, bladder cancer, uh, and then really across all solid tumors. And if you think about how this is working, it's pretty clear that tumor mutational burden in and of itself may not be enough. And this model just shows that um, you have all these neoantigens because of the high mutational burden, but if there isn't any inf inflammation, you're not necessarily going to get that um, immune reaction. So you really need to stimulate that uh, in patients. If you look across uh, TMB, across uh, over 100,000 uh, cases, you see going from lowest to highest, esophageal breasts were among the lowest with elevated TMB, and the highest with skin and lung cancers. Of course, we've seen that really across the board in terms of mutation. Um, this group also looks at uh, tumor mutational burden, high and low, and you can see there's, a, there's an impact in terms of uh, uh, how those patients do. And the GEP stands for gene expression pattern. So they looked for an inflamed gene expression pattern and found that if you're double high, so on the, on the graph all the way to the right there, if you're double high, you had actually a, a better prognosis than if you, were, uh, if you weren't, and same with the responses. So TMB has been correlated with benefit from checkpoint inhibitors across multiple tumor types. It's tied to these neoantigens. It seems to be independent of PD-L1 and the T-cell inflamed gene expression pattern. They, these markers appear to be additive, as I showed you. But I tell you, one issue with TMB is the lack of standardization and cutoffs. So you often see greater than 10, um, but you have to be looking at, are they looking just at exons, introns, exons, et cetera? So um, those kind of technical things really need to be worked out. Uh, of course, PDL1 was like that initially, too, right? We had eight antibodies and all these different things. So I think over time, all of these will become uh, more standardized. Thank you. That was an over excellent overview. So for colon cancer, just, you know, the, the high-level point is that um, patients who have mismatch repair deficiency should be considered for immunotherapy. 
and Dr. S uh, Meshaneth went very nicely through the data of combination versus single agent. So um, we're on to our um, case practicums. And maybe before we just do the case, since, um, we might be good to just highlight some questions relevant to um, your topic, Wells. Um, so one question that I see here is, um, is there any difference in response to immuno, uh, in immune checkpoint inhibition therapy uh, between inherited versus somatic MSI high tumors? To my knowledge, no. So, um, and it's sort of interesting because with the recent approval of PARP inhibitors, we're getting a lot of those questions, right? Because a lot of those were tested just in germline, for instance, right. uh, BRCA. But um, I've never seen any data to indicate that it matters whether or not you're a lynch or not to whether or not you respond to these drugs. Right. And your table, actually, you, the, show that, it shows yeah. that as well. And then... Um, I think there's another one uh, relative to what you just talked about. Is immunotherapy effective in BRAF positive tumors? Yeah, so that table I showed, um, uh, basically looking at whether or not you are uh, BRAF mutated or not, and again, BRAF being a more aggressive subtype, um, it did not seem to affect that you had similar uh, response rates, whether you're BRAF positive um, or negative. Yeah, perfect. I also just want to mention, as many people in this room likely know, that BRAF mutation positive disease does run with microsatellite instability, and that's about a third of patients. So if you have a situation where you've got an MSI high patient or a BRAF mutation patient, you should always make sure that that other testing is performed, um, since it's such a high correlation. Okay. Say again, so about half, you said? It's a third. A third. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, so let's talk uh, about the cases here. So here's the first case, a uh, patient with metastatic colorectal cancer, a 52-year-old woman um, with right-sided MSI high metastatic colorectal cancer with disease progression on first-line K-pox and bevacizumab. The patient has um, had an uncomplicated uh, past medical history no, no, uh, on no prior medications. Um, she's having some abdominal pain, back pain from multiple metastatic sites. Aggressive pain management has been helpful, but she has numerous side effects from the pain medications. She comes into the office today to discuss next steps. So I think this is a discussion now. So there are many options. Dr. Azad, what do you think in terms of her options and what would we consider? So in the vast majority of our patients that present with microsatellite instability, we generally start with single agent therapy um, because even in patients where um, we don't necessarily see a, a resist criteria response, we often see significant improvement um, in their symptom control without the added toxicity of the CTLA-4 inhibitor. Um, but I think this is kind of a, a questionable case considering how symptomatic she is. Um, and I think depending on how bad her pain control is, you, this might be one of the cases where you would start with doublet therapy. Probably. I don't know what you think, Wells. Yeah, so I agree. So I think it's really important when you're seeing a colorectal cancer patient, um, you know, because there have been studies mainly from Northern Europe looking at sequential versus concomitant. And uh, oftentimes, if, they're, if you don't need a response, you don't need to hit them with all these drugs um, um, all at once. In a case like this, I, you know, knowing that the response rate goes from the low 30s to the mid 50s, um, this is this is sort of a case where I probably would use both an, both antibodies because I really want to try to improve this person's quality of life. You're just giving four doses, um, but you're right. You're going to buy a little bit more on the autoimmune toxicity. So, um, but but this is a case where I'd probably choose number three. I'd go with both. But let me ask you. So, you know, what about chemotherapy? I mean, it's it, we know that it works in some patients. Full theory, you know. Yeah, that, to me, from my standpoint. So first of all. Um, uh, we know that second-line response rates, going back to the old French study, you know, are, are less than 10 percent. So right away, you're losing, you know, 40 percent points <laughs> right off the top. Secondly, you know, ranitidine is a much harder drug than than immunotherapy, and and instead of some people call it punitive chemotherapy instead of palliative chemotherapy. Um, and of course, this is a right-sided tumor, um, which really takes me away from panitumumab. Although I know it's debated. I'm on the NCCN panel, and there are some panelists who feel strongly about this, that the, um, the 80405 is in the first-line setting. Maybe you can consider it in the second-line setting. Um, I, I don't really view it that way, but, but some people do view it that way. And, of course, you're going to get more rash and, you know, other problems there. So from my standpoint, going with the chemotherapy option, 
uh, I have pretty low enthusiasm, given the fact we've got an option with a 55% response rate and single digits grade three toxicity. So just Dr. Azad, we don't have a randomized trial. We know chemotherapy works. We don't have a randomized trial comparing it to immunotherapy. What do you say? I completely agree with Wells. So we, we <laughs> um, you know, we, we want to try to get these drugs into patients as soon as possible because for the majority of patients, you know, we talked about um, the, the response rate, but if you look at the stable disease rate, which is also at 80% for single or double agent therapy, um, you can very quickly move these people into a situation where they're going to have excellent quality of life um, and may live for many years without the toxicity of chemotherapy. So yeah. The other issue I think you have to consider when you're trying to figure out when to start these is the kinetics of response. So yeah. I will say, if you're destined to have a response with, with Fulfiri and you're destined to have a response with immunotherapy, the Fulfiri one will probably come quicker, right? So, um, you know, another reason I'd like to start these a little earlier is because I know the first scan probably is not going to show all that much. It's really the second scan or the third scan. Um, so the kinetics take a little bit longer, so I tend to start it a little bit earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's a good point. And I think the other thing that I just might mention is that, you know, Patients can tolerate chemotherapy just fine after immunotherapy if, they, if their performance status is adequate. But in this type of patient with significant burden of disease, significant pain, if, if the patient you know, doesn't respond to chemotherapy, you may not have an opportunity. They may be very you know, ill to get immunotherapy. I would love to pick up on that for a second, though, yeah. because um, I think that, that, that is, it is always better to do um, what's, gonna, what's more likely to work and work for longer earlier. But um, one of the things that's really beautiful about immunotherapy, PD-1 and PD-L1, and these MSI high patients is that even in patients that um, are really looking like they're at their end of their life, you can, you can initiate therapy. You can still therapy. salvage, yeah. Um, and so I would just say that in the setting where you've got a patient who has a performance status that's significantly worse than you would usually start start a therapy, um, this is still a place where you would really want to give it a shot because you, you really could provide significant benefit and actually completely reverse the trajectory of their lives. Um, and we've seen that time and time again in, um, on the trials and now in real life. Great. We do actually, there's one question that, I, that maybe I thought we could talk about uh, before getting to the second case, and, and that is, do you ever start with single agent PD-1 inhibitor therapy and then add a CTLA-4 therapy if the patient doesn't respond as you like. <laughs> beauty before um, age, beauty before age. Yes, yeah, so, so, so there is not data to support that approach. Um, I can't say I've never done it. Um, and I can't say that sometimes when I have done it, it's gone okay. Um, but the, the data suggests that if you do single agent therapy, that the, that you've committed to single agent therapy, um, and we don't know that we can necessarily reverse resistance with adding the CTLA-4 inhibitor. But biologically, it makes sense that that could happen considering what CTLA-4 does. Um, and so in the right setting, I think it's, it's not on label, but it's something that could be considered. You agree? Yep. Okay, <clears throat> excellent. So the answer is um, not data supported, but it's not the board's answer. Could, could consider <laughs> Not the board's answer. I love it. All right, so the next case. Um, the same patient. The 52-year-old woman, right-sided MSI high colon cancer, um, uncomplicated past medical history, uh, but she's asymptomatic. She had progression of first-line therapy, you know, radiographically, but, you know, as far as you can tell, she's, she can still beat you at tennis. Um, she comes into to the office to discuss next steps. Um, so n now it's the same patient, but less disease burden, less symptoms. Uh, sort of highlight the patient's asymptomatic. You don't need to um, have the dual inhibitor therapy in a patient that's highly likely to respond um, with single agent therapy. Um, so, but there is a question here that we should talk about. Um, could we comment on the duration of IO therapy in a patient who's responded to immunotherapy? Um, I think I think Neela should take this one because you guys did two years. Correct? Yeah. So so our, in the clinical trials that uh, eventually led to approval, we did two years of therapy, and then patients came off study. Um, and I will say that of of all the patients that went on and were still stable at two years, I've had not a single patient who's recurred. So we now have people who are six and seven years out um, after that first two years, either in uh, partial response, complete response, or even stable disease with active cancer. But uh, 
remaining that way. Now, if you do end up having progression, you can go back and re-challenge uh, re with the PD-1 inhibitor. And have you had success with that? Has that worked? So is that, I was saying in my, in my practice, I actually haven't had anyone who has progressed oh, on it. I see. Um, there are actually now um, two, I think, meaningful clinical trials because uh, my talk is coming, but what I'm going to be pushing is that we should be putting people in clinical trials. Um, and so there's two clinical trials that are looking at combination therapy for patients who progress on PD-1 inhibitors that are MSI high. And one of those trials is going to be through the NCI match, so it will be open across the nation. And so hopefully most patients would have access to a site um, that would give combination PD-1 plus LAG3, um, which is a, another immune checkpoint for these patients. I don't, I must say, I don't <coughs> automatically stop at two years because I'm, I'm, I'm just... Uh, scared sometimes when someone's having a really good response, yeah. like, and, and we just don't know. Um, I've had some patients who are in clinical trials where we've <laughs> stopped and then have started to grow, but luckily per protocol, we can put them back on. Um, I have, really haven't had enough time to see. Um, but uh, I've really struggled because uh, the, you know, you, the patient sitting in front of you saying, well, I'm benefiting, are you sure you can stop it? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's important, though, obviously economically, because these are very expensive drugs, and you know whether or not we keep them going or stop, it's you know it's kind of a Tesla every couple months. So you really have to think about that. So I have the opposite experience. So I've had a patient, several, who have responded, but we've had to stop because of some toxicity. So we should talk about IR-related toxicity, um, and and they've actually continued to respond even after stopping treatment after like six months or eight months or a year. Um, and they so far haven't recurred. Um, so, so I'm of the mindset that I, I rarely give more than two years. Actually, I don't think I have. Um, and sometimes I give less because of toxicity. So I, I think the answer to this question, which is a great question, is um, empirically, the studies have stopped at two years, and, and so I think most people would say that's probably what we have data for. Uh, but we don't actually have a biologic reason or scientific reason to stop um, or to give less. Um, is that fair? Yeah. Um, so but let's talk about IR-related, um, immune-related toxicities. Um, so you know, what, what are the common things that we see, and are there, are there some that happen later in the course, things like that? So, um, Dr. Azad, you want to talk, start? So the, the most common toxicities that we see, of course, is, is thyroid dysfunction. And, and many people, we end up, they get bought onto lifelong uh, thyroid replacement. And actually arthritis, which we, we see um, more than I think that we, we talk about um, and can be quite debilitating even when it's considered low grade. Um, so the, the more severe toxicities that can be life-limiting, like colitis and pneumonitis, um, hypophysitis, those are very uncommon, actually, um, especially with single-agent therapy. We see them, but um, it, it's, I would say it's actually that, and, and then the, the derm toxicities that are, are the ones that we most deal with. What about you guys? Yeah, I agree. I think, um, boy, when you do see colitis, pneumonitis, nephritis, it can be adventuresome. Uh, I mean, we've, I've had some cardiac toxicity. I actually wasn't aware that if you have a patient on immune therapy who feels perfectly well and has a normal ECG, but as a high troponin, you probably should admit that patient yeah. put them on monitoring, and they have a 50% mortality. Um, I've had some very complicated hepatitis, <coughs> uh, which I'm actually managing now uh, in the hospital, and, and nephritis, which has taken a long time. So I've gotten to know my rheumatology colleagues pretty well. Yeah. Um, and we're actually setting up an onco-rheumatology clinic. Uh, you guys might already have them um, in our center to go along with onco-nephrology and onco-other things that we have, but uh, because we really need help with the rheumatologist. Another question that came up is, what if you have rheumatoid arthritis? Well, how bad is the rheumatoid arthritis? Or, right. you know, I had colitis 10 years ago, but I lost the records, and I think they said Crohn's, but I don't know, maybe something I ate. You know, it's really, really hard sometimes to figure these things out. No, that's really... Important. I, I, so I've had um, a couple of patients unfortunately pass away from toxicity, um, and you know it it can be subtle. So adrenal insufficiency, and the patient sort of couldn't maintain his blood pressure, and and it's something that you know looking back, it's like you know it's obvious. So it's just you know unusual things can happen rarely, um, but as I think I agree with you, the things that are common 
you know, the thyroid, um, the rash, uh, arth arthritic symptoms, those, those are things that, you know, we can commonly manage. But if you have someone that has unusual manifestations, you should think of an immune-mediated mechanism. I also mentioned that I had an interesting experience because I, um, I was involved in the nivolumab um, NCI match trial, um, and so all of the immune toxicities would come to me in terms of management, and I'd have to, to give my opinion about it. And I was also involved in the pembrolizumab study that Dr. Lee and Diaz did. Um, and there was a big difference in the community in terms of how immune toxicities are treated and how many patients were pulled off of therapy for immune toxicities where um, when we were doing the Prembo study, we would treat through it. Um, and so I think one of the, the highlight of that is that um, really do get to know your rheumatology colleagues and your endocrine colleagues, because um, I, I think there are actually many times where um, we might pull back on therapy for patients when we don't need to. And then, of course, the opposite, when we, we need to be able to recognize when these toxicities happen. But um, the labels are very helpful in that setting to be able to, to really figure out um, when you can continue to treat a patient or not. But it's not necessarily as intuitive as we would think. Is there any relation between the development of an IR-related toxicity and efficacy? It's not an actual question. <laughs> so, no dessert for whoever asked that question. <laughs> Um, so it hasn't been well demonstrated, and not just in, in MSI high um, cancers, but across, uh, across immunotherapy and other um, types as well. Um, it, it's not a, a tight correlation in any way between if someone develops toxicity or not. I think people are thinking maybe along the lines of like rash and yeah. EGFR inhibitor. Uh, <coughs> but I think part of the problem, though, is if someone gets severe, you're starting steroids, and what are you doing to the yeah. response? And it gets tricky. I would say, though, I, I, maybe you could comment on this. I think that the longer you're on immunotherapy, the more likely you're going to get some of these toxicities. So, so the correlation isn't early on. It may be later on. And that's just you know, because you've been on the nature of the... It's like a cliplatin. You know, the longer you're on it, the more likely you're going to get neuropathy. I think, I think that that's probably true. Um, okay, so let's do this um, third case here, a 92-year-old woman with metastatic GE junction cancer to the lungs, um, modest comorbidities. She had uh, heart disease 14 years earlier, arthritis, hypertension, breast cancer 30 years earlier. Um, she received full FOX chemotherapy, God bless her, um, tolerated well, but then progressed. She remains active, independent. What do you do now? So. Dr. Mesher Smith, what would you do? Sounds like she's doing uh, she's doing pretty well. Yeah, we got progression, so we're now in the second line setting. <coughs> and I would want to know, uh, I'd like to know her PD, so her CPS or TPS? Yeah, CPS, uh, right for gastric for junction. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I should have said she's mismatch repair uh, proficient, and she's HER2 negative. Dr. Azad, any thoughts? I mean, I, I think that um, if, if she's got um, a, an appropriate CPS score that I would seriously consider treating her with immunotherapy. There's no, there's no reason that an older person... Um, exactly, right. So, so there isn't an age limit on who should get immunotherapy. Um, so um, she, she did receive a couple doses of paclitaxel ramucirumab, the second-line uh, drug, uh, but she discontinued because of fatigue. Um, her CPS score was, in fact, 20, and um, the um, panels on the left there show the response to immunotherapy over time. Um, and, and Dr. Messerschmidt uh, mentioned this earlier, the, you know, it's the... Um, the rapidity of response to immunotherapy isn't like in, in the first six weeks. So this, you know, patient responded over eight, 12 weeks, but even at 24 weeks was still responding. You can see that uh, that timeline. Um, and this picture is actually her with permission. Um, and and that, that picture is already a year old and she's still shopping on Madison Avenue. So um, it is, you know, when it works, it can work really well and it can be life altering. I will say, uh and different opinions. I have seen, um, even from our, our, our own nurses sometimes, confusion about TPS and CPS. Yes, right. And which one to order and when, and to kind of really paying attention to that. I think <coughs> some people might not realize the difference. Right. Um, so it's really something to pay attention to on the reports, uh, because I'll, you know, the, the person referring will say, well, 
positive CPS score, and I look and it's actually TPS, and it's not the same thing. Right, so. and the, actually that's a really great point. So on the pathology reports, I mean, you know, we're learning just like the pathologists are learning. So, so I've I've had reports that said that the um, you know uh, the tumor score or the CPS score was negative. Um, but in fact, if you, if you asked them, they said it was one. And they thought that you know, one or less was negative. So they gave you a, a negative score, even though the patient was positive. Um, so it really is important, as Dr. Messersmith says, to, to look at those reports carefully. For gastric and GE junction and esophageal cancer, the important score is the combined positive score, CPS. That's of both the tumor and the infiltrating lymphocytes. And um, it's a ratio of that over the tumor cells. Um, for, and that's really only for pembrolizumab. For the other immune checkpoint inhibitors, specifically nivolumab, um, there hasn't been any um, a selection based on a positive tumor or um, combined positive score. And it's, it's confusing because most, patient, most physicians treat other cancers like lung cancer where there's a different scoring range um, and other things like that. So it's a really key, key point. Um, okay, so uh, we have a few minutes for any other questions. Let's just go through a little bit. Um, so I'll, there's one question for attraction three. I'll answer that. Um, what are the practical implications of attraction three in second line esophageal squamous cell cancer? If nivolumab receives regulatory approval, how would you approach treatment selection? So um, just to remind people that the question, the study in question is in esophageal squamous cell cancer, it was nivolumab versus chemotherapy, and it was positive. Um, roughly the hazard ratio was similar to the um, study with pembrolizumab, which was positive for CPS 10 or higher. Um, so, you know, in, I think the practical implication is that if nivolumab gets approved, as, uh, you know, looking at the data for the um, pembrolizumab study, we did see that there, there numerically was benefit in squamous cell cancer all comers, maybe perhaps enriched for CPS 10 or higher. So for patients who are squamous cell cancer, if nivolumab is approved, I would be inclined to give it because um, I do think that that is activity. Patients with esophageal cancer really don't have that many options. Um, but I think it's an important question. You know, right now we don't have any comparative data between nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and I don't think we will have comparative data. They're both PD-1 inhibitors, um, and, and they both have activity. Um, and I think the difference that you may be sort of picking up on between a biomarker versus not is that there, there really are differences in the clone that's used to test for the biomarker. So the, the Merck um, uh, biomarker uses a different clone than the, the other companies are, are using. And, and so in, in, with one biomarker, it could be positive. The other biomarker, biomarker may not be useful. Um, any other questions that we should answer real quick uh, or discuss, I should say? Um, I think we answered a lot of these questions. I think Dr. Zad is up. It's seven. Yeah. So I think the next Masterclass 3, Dr. Zad will talk about new directions, a look to the future, um, and rational approaches with immunotherapies and combinations. Thank you, Anish. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to bring up the, the tail end of this um, really great CME so far um, to really talk about what we're going to do with the problem that these therapies are really only working for a minority of patients. Um, and so what I'm hoping I'll leave you with is some real enthusiasm for um, some of the approaches that are moving forward um, and a sense of how many strategies are out in the clinic um, in clinical trials right now um, so that I really hope that in the next few years we're going to start seeing some really exciting positive results um, for the 95% of patients with colorectal cancer that are microsatellite stable and you know, the majority of gastric and GE junction patients, they're still not benefiting from these therapies. 
So in order to do this, I think we need to, to really speak to the biological challenges that exist with these cancers um, in terms of why it's so difficult to, for immunotherapy to work. Um, and then I hope that I can highlight some of the clinical trials, some that have been reported and some that are ongoing, that really show some of the strategies that researchers are using right now um, in order to move the field forward. And so this uh, series of figures, I think, really highlights what the problem is when it comes to um, how we're trying to attack these cancers. So um, Ira Melman's group um, did this beautiful paper where they really tried to explain to, to the rest of us that when we talk about tumors that don't respond to immunotherapy, we talk about cold tumors, tumors that are um, intrinsically not responsive to immunotherapy, that there's not just one reason that that's happening, and there's not even just one kind of cancer. Um, and in fact, they, they talk about three different major buckets of non-responsive cancers. And so one of those buckets, and we see all of these in our gastric cancer and colorectal cancer patients. So we have tumors that um, are in an immune desert. So if you look an, at the tumor biologically, you're just not seeing any immune interaction with the tumor. There's just a complete lack of immune infiltration. If there are some immune cells, they're immunosuppressive, but there's really just not much going on at all in the tumor microenvironment. It almost looks like the immune system doesn't even know that tissue is there. And then on the other hand, you've got areas where you've actually got a lot of immune inflammation, so there's all sorts of immune cells that are present. You've got many kinds of cytotoxic immune cells as well as cells that are immunosuppressive. They're chock full, but clearly the balance is off. So instead of being able to use the immune system to attack the cancer, the cancer is able to survive and propagate. And then the third bucket is really the stromal um, component where it's not the immune system, but it's the actual stroma around the tumor things including the vasculature, the actual fibrotic tissue around tumors that are making it very difficult for the immune system to be able to interact. And so it's a really elegant way to kind of highlight some, the, the challenges that exist. And then on the right side is this really daunting figure that t shows the number of immune cells and immune stimuli that exist. Um, and this is not even exhaustive. And you can see on the left side of this figure, um, on the left side of the figure here, we've got all the different kinds of cells that actually you would want favorably to help with an immune response, the different kinds of cytokine profiles and chemokines that could be useful in terms of stimuli to activate against cancer. And on the right side, you've got the same, if not more, cell types that are actually immunosuppressive. And the stimuli in the tumor microenvironment that allow the tumor to propagate. And so clearly in our cancers, everything is shifted more towards the right, uh, where the cancers are really able to propagate and the immune system is not able to control their growth. Now we do have a lot of tools. We talked all day this, uh, this evening about PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, a little bit about CTLA inhibitors, but immunotherapy is far more than just these two immune checkpoints. Um, and in fact, we've got many new tools that are emerging and older tools. So we have you know, some of the oldest immunotherapy agents or cytokines like IL-2 and interferon gamma that have not been active um, in these tumor types. But now in the clinic and in clinical trials, we've got new cytokines that are being utilized. People can get IL-8, their clinical trials with IL-12 in combination with other immunotherapy agents. We've got a large group of immune checkpoints past PD-1 and PD-L1 um, that are being tested in the clinic in combination. We've got T cell therapies that have, are getting approved. Um, they're extraordinarily expensive and resource heavy, um, but that's a way where we can actually give immune cells to patients that target a particular antigen. And this doesn't even speak to the fact that other classes of drugs, molecularly targeted drugs, epigenetic drugs, anti-angiogenic drugs, all of these agents actually also have immune effects. So we can combine classes of drugs that are traditional immunotherapy with targeted therapy, but do it for an improved immune response. And because of this, this figure in the next slide just highlight the vast number of potential um, combinations that are possible and are actually being tested in the clinic right now. And so if we look at what's happening in the clinic, in clinical trials, we've got just in this last week, this is what I pulled, we've got 350 clinical trials 
in colorectal cancer, 150 clinical trials in gastric cancer that are being done right now that are immune-related clinical trials. And so what, if you leave with one thing tonight, it's that we need patients referred for clinical trials early and often because there's no way that we're gonna be able to dissect these many different strategies without enrolling patients in clinical trials and being able to really figure out which of these strategies might be best. And for every given patient, there may be a completely different strategy that's important. And so um, the, the enrollment of patients in clinical trials is just key right now. So now I'm gonna move into some of the clinical trials that I think are, are interesting to highlight, and I'm gonna give you a caveat up front, um, mostly because I don't wanna insult any of my colleagues, but also um, we could have a multi-day conference on the different immunotherapy approaches that are ongoing right now in colorectal cancer and gastric cancer. So what I've tried to do is pick either a few key studies that there's been a lot of buzz about, um, or things that I think just really highlight interesting approaches to how we should think about combining these kinds of agents. And I'm gonna start with the, the most important negative trial that was done so that we can just go upward from here. So this is the clinical trial of atezolizumab and cobimetinib um, that was reported, the phase three of this study was just reported in the last year. But let's talk about how this actually moved forward and why we even went to phase three with this combination. Um, and so there is preclinical data that suggested that MEK inhibitors could potentially have an immunomodulatory effect and, and actually affect T cell exhaustion so that they would be more likely to work with PD-1 inhibitors. And so um, Johanna Bendel and her group um, explored this in a phase one study that was reported out a few years, a couple of years ago now, um, a cobimetinib, that's the MEK inhibitor, with a tezolizumab, that's a PDL1 inhibitor, in patients with um, colon cancer. And this was a basket study with many different cohorts, but we're gonna focus on the colorectal cancer cohort because as Wells showed you, there was a 0% response rate for MSS colon cancer in multiple studies that were published. But here they had multiple patients that responded. So the response rate was low, it was 8%. Um, and of the, the five patients where they had MSS status, um, four of those patients, they were known to be microsatellite stable. But this was really the first study that showed some responses in microsatellite stable colorectal cancer. And on top of that, the patients that actually responded, responded for a good long time. So over a year, 14 months, duration, median duration of response. So it made sense to try to explore this further, especially when the overall survival, again, this was a non-randomized study, um, but in these 80 patients that were enrolled, the overall survival was favorable to our historical controls of, of Lonserf and Regorafenib with a median survival um, that was over a year um, for patients with MS. SS colon. So based on these hints and some preclinical data that supported the approach, the trial was moved to a phase three study, and as you all likely know, um, this was a clinical trial that was negative. So this was in the third line setting, uh, atezolizumab with cobimetinib versus either regorafenib or um, TAS-102, which is uh, Lonserf, and this trial was completely negative, progression-free survival, overall survival, um, it was a negative study. And so while this is a disappointment, um, I do think that there is, let's, let's be glass half full about the situation, um, and that is that within three years, we went from a phase one study to a fully enrolled global phase three study, and we got results. So that speaks to, of course, the need that exists, but the ability for us to really test these hypotheses quickly because um, of the fact that these are, are trials that patients really want. Now, in gastric cancer and in other, um, in other combinations, it's not like targeted therapy is being set aside because of this one negative study. And so um, cabozatinib um, has been tested also in a basket study and shown to have a 10% response rate in patients with gastric cancer. As Manish has demonstrated, um, the, the response rate of PD-1 inhibitors in gastric cancer um, can range from 10 to 15%. And so um, presently through the cooperative groups, a clinical trial is moving forward, I think is important to highlight, um, and hopefully refer patients to, where, which is testing Pembro plus cabozatinib versus Pembro um, alone for patients with no more than two prior lines of therapy. And so we hope that these results will report out in the next one to two years as well. <clears throat> but 
we have many different targeted therapies, so how do we choose which of these drugs we should combine with our immunotherapy agents? Um, and so there are laboratory-based researchers that are really trying to answer this question um, in, in robust ways, um, and I wanted to highlight one such researcher and her work um, and how we are using um, this kind of strategy to try to figure out how best to combine drugs. So this is work from Natalie Collins um, out of Dana-Farber. Um, and what Natalie did was she took cell line, colocancerous cell lines and she transfected them with a pooled library of the most common mutations that occur in cancer. Um, and then she implanted those cells into mice and she put them under immune pressure, so she gave them PD-1 inhibition. And the tumors that grew would be the tumors that had mutations that were resistant to PD-1 inhibitors. So this was how to predict resistance to PD-1 inhibition. And when she scored those mutations, what she found was that PI3 kinase mutations, multiple PI3 kinase mutations that are quite common, especially quite common in colorectal cancer, scored high in terms of creating intrinsic resistance to PD-1 inhibitors. So this begs the question, is the PI3 kinase pathway involved in the, the fact that we have resistance, basically, from the get-go of colon cancer to um, PD-1 inhibitors? To further test that, she then took these mice and planted them with these same PI3 kinase mutated cancers, showed that they were resistance to, PD, to PD-1, but then when she gave a PI3 kinase inhibitor in combination with PD-1, she was able to reverse the resistance, and that's what you see on the right. Now these animals and their tumors were sensitive to PD-1 inhibition when you combine it. So she was able to use a screening platform to pick what would be the best kind of drug to combine with a PD-1 inhibitor um, in a colon cancer model. Model. And so based on that, we have moved forward through the Stand Up to Cancer, um, colorectal cancer, Stand Up to Cancer Dream Team, testing this in patients. So we're presently enrolling a clinical trial with a PI3 kinase inhibitor in combination with PD-1 inhibitors, and we're enrolling patients that have PI3 kinase mutations, which is about 15% to 20% of colon cancer patients. Um, and the study also has an arm that has patients that don't have PI3 kinase mutations, but perhaps if the PI3 kinase pathway activating is what's causing resistance, we may see some benefit in those patients too. And so this is a study that's actively enrolling now, whoops, um, and we hope to see um, benefit or at least re results in the next year. Now there's been a lot of excitement about the idea of combining immunotherapy with VEGF inhibition. Um, I will admit that I was initially skeptical about this approach, um, uh, but uh, as some uh, may know from earlier, uh, just a few months ago, there's been data in hepatocellular cancer that has suggested an overall survival benefit with the combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab. In colon cancer and gastric cancer, the Regoraf and Ibnivolumab study has had some similar, pretty exciting results. So this was a, a study, a phase one trial, trying to give regorafenib, which is a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor of the VEGF receptors, in combination with nivolumab, um, both in patients with gastric cancer and patients with colon cancer. And here what you can see is that both in colon cancer and in gastric cancer, you're seeing multiple responses. Here in colon cancer, um, you've got response rates in the 30 percentile, 40% um, for gastric cancer, and if you look at the bottom panel, the duration of response for these patients that have partial responses um, is substantial. So this is the most exciting data that has been presented, small study, but still uh, extraordinarily exciting data um, in terms of potential potentially having benefit with combination therapy in MSS colorectal cancer and gastric cancer. The duration of treatment for these patients um, was substantial if they were um, able to get a response, and the progression-free survival um, of this was also favorable compared to the historical control, just regorafenib alone being two months. Um, this is being at six months with um, the combination. So a phase three of this is presently planned. I hope that's going to enroll just as quickly as the atezo Kobe study did, um, but I hope that this study is going to end up being positive um, based on these data.
Now, when they tried to explore why this might be, um, what they have found from the initial biopsies that they did from these trials is that the regorafenib might be acting to actually decrease the immunosuppressive cells that are present in tumor. Um, and so this is a case of the gastric cancer patient that had a really nice response to therapy, actually initially got um, nivolumab alone, um, the number of immunosuppressive cells went up at the time of progression. Um, so then they were 50% of the, the, the um, CD4 compartment. And then when regorafenib was added back in, now that number dropped again and the patient um, responded to therapy. There's also, of course, excitement about vaccine-based therapies. Um, some of the um, work that's being done is really focusing on how we can use vaccines to identify the right antigens in tumors um, so that we can vaccinate patients and get benefit in immunotherapy. And so this work has actually been um, really nicely um, highlighted first by Kathy Wu's group in melanoma. So this is just one melanoma slide, but I think is demonstrative of the concept. Um, and what their group did was they took melanoma patients that were going to surgery, high-risk melanoma patients, and they sequenced those patients. So their tumors were operated on, they sequenced them, and then they fed that sequencing data through a computerized algorithm that predicted the top peptides that would be antigenic, that would, the immune system would respond to, and then they generated a personalized vaccine for that given patient and gave it back to the patient. And they were able to show that the immune system, the T cells actually did respond to those antigens. And this was a feasibility study. I'll say each, uh, now that we're running one of these trials, each one of these vaccines costs 50 to $75,000 per patient to make. So these are extraordinarily expensive studies to do. Um, but in this feasibility study, every single patient benefited from the vaccination, potentially. The patients that had stage three disease, none of them recurred, even with high risk disease and the patients with stage four disease that had curative resections that did recur as soon as they got um, PD-1 inhibition after the vaccination, they had complete responses to therapy. So small numbers, but I think really um, provocative in terms of what we could potentially do. Um, and so we are moving forward uh, on a clinical trial with that kind of setting um, in colon cancer as well. So this is the same idea that we biopsy patients, we sequence their tumors, and then we use a computerized algorithm to predict which of these peptides would bind best um, to the antigen pockets in MHC molecules on the surface of antigen-presenting cells, and then we're gonna generate a peptide vaccine for that patient. And so this is being done in patients with colon cancer. Um, this study should be opening in the next couple of months. Um, and so patients will go on, this is for the metastatic setting, they'll go on to first-line chemotherapy while their tumors are being sequenced, and then if they have stable disease, Disease, and when it's time for their maintenance chemotherapy, they'll start with vaccination with immune checkpoint inhibition. And we have preclinical data that supports that this could be an exciting approach as well. Can we use some of the molecular features and abnormalities in colon cancer or gastric cancer um, when we think of vaccines? There is some data to suggest that KRAS might be something that we could actually target immunologically. So this was a New England Journal case report from Steve Rosenberg's group uh, where they used adoptive T cell therapy. They grew up T cells from patients' tumors and gave them back to the patients targeted towards KRAS and were able to show a complete response to therapy um, in that patient. So potentially there is something in KRAS that we might be able to target um, immunologically. And so there are vaccine-based approaches, and that's one of the things that we are also interested in exploring. So this is um, work by Niha Zaidi, um, where a vaccine has been generated to the most common mutations that we see in KRAS. Patients will get these vaccines after they complete their adjuvant therapy uh, with surgical resection, and the goal would be that we would be able to vaccinate these patients so if they have microscopic residual disease, the immune system would be able to come in um, after adjuvant therapy and clean it up. And in my last couple of uh, 10 seconds, I, I'd love to talk about uh, one of the more exciting things that I think came out of this same meeting a year ago, um, uh, which is radiation-based approach uh, based approaches in colorectal cancer um, with uh, immunotherapy as well. Um, so this was a study that was presented 
Aparna Parikh and Ted Hong's work, giving ipilimumab and nivolumab with radiation in patients that had microsatellite-stable colon cancer and pancreatic cancer. We'll focus today on the, the colon cancer cohort. And the idea here is that if you give radiation to patients that you might be causing DNA damage that generates new, new antigens, or you might be able to release some neoantigens from the cell, from the tr treatment itself, and that that could be used by the immune system to recognize the tumor. So the way this trial was designed, patients got six weeks of nivolumab and ipilimumab. I'll remind you, is all microsatellite-stable patients. And then they got low doses of radiation to one single tumor, and they measured what happened to the tumors outside of the radiation field um, to determine whether there was benefit or not. And here, as you see, this isn't the same kind of waterfall plot that you see with MSI colon cancer at all. Um, but you did, they did see responses with a therapy that is known to not be effective in MSS colon alone, NEVO and IPI. And the other thing that was really interesting about their trial was that they lost a lot of patients on the study um, to being able to go on to radiation because they progressed in that first six weeks, because they were really getting an ineffective therapy for six weeks. Um, and so the new iteration of their trial is that they're going to actually move up radiation so that it's being given early in the treatment. They don't have that six-week window, and they're hoping that they'll be able to capture more benefit than they even saw with this 15% response rate. The patients on this study that responded, they continued to respond, um, and I think it speaks to a really exciting potential strategy. So I hope I've given a little bit of a flavor of a few of the strategies that are existing right now um, in terms of trying to make immunotherapy work better for our colon cancer patients and gastric cancer patients. But as you can see, there's so many different combinations to explore and so much biology that we really need to understand better about these patients that patients need to get referred for clinical trials as often and as early as possible so we can really start answering some of these questions even better and really make a difference for the majority of our patients. Thank you. Terrific. So um, we are just a little bit over, but I, I'd like to really quickly go through some quite last burning questions um, and then ha offer an opportunity for other questions from the audience. Um, so um, one question I wanted to address is um, we talked a lot about the activity of immunotherapy and MSI high or mismatch repair deficient tumors, but you know, not everybody responds. And, and so the question is, are there, you know, what are the options for patients who don't respond specifically in that group? Um, any thoughts there? Well, uh, you know, first of all, you, d you do have conventional, you know, chemotherapy drugs. And, and many of the trials that have retrospectively looked at MSI patients, they still get benefit from conventional chemotherapy. Um, and then I'm often looking for combination uh, immunotherapy trials for those patients along the themes of what Neela was, you know, saying. Some trials are actually specifically looking for patients that will have, you know, expansion slots only for patients who've progressed on immunotherapy. And, this, and so they're testing a second-line option because if you think about it, across all tumor types, there could be <laughs> hundreds of thousands of these people across all the tumor types you see. And whoever can figure out how to kind of reverse that resistance will be very interesting. A great point. So, um, similar to the KRAS vaccine trial that uh, you mentioned, um, we are participating in a trial um, where the top, I think, 200 um, neoantigens created in an MSI high pool. Um, a you know, so a company created a vaccine for that uh, specific population. And so the study is in patients who've received immunotherapy, progressed, and then they, it would be with this vaccine plus immunotherapy. So that, that you know, those kinds of novel things are happening. Um, and then the other question that I wanted to address, um, so, you know, in, in this era of precision oncology, um, there may be a case where you have an NTREC inhibitor plus uh, mismatch repair um, uh, high status. So how would you choose between an NTREC inhibitor, uh, which, you know, in a small patient set, but, you know, a response rates of, what, 80% or something like that versus uh, uh, immunotherapy? Any thoughts there? Okay. You know, I think, uh, first of all, uh, NTRAC is 1 in 3,000 in colon. So first yeah. I'd have a moment of silence for NTRAC. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, as I, I, I think with colon can colorectal cancer, luckily, 
Um, it's not as much of a, a, a disease that just takes off on you as much as gastric and some of these other ones. So oftentimes I, I find patients are um, so excruciating decision of like, do I do A or then B or B then A? And I'm like, you're going to be able to do both probably, right? Hopefully. So, um, uh, so I, you know, I don't feel strongly either way. I, again, it might come back to this issue of how symptomatic are they? What's yeah. the benefit? Um, and then finally, the, the all-important question is what's their copay? Huh, true. Dr. Rosada, any thoughts on that? No, I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, I've, I've never seen it. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but, but I think that I probably would pick based on which has the least side effect profile. Um, but I, I would probably leave it up to the patient. I, I don't think it needs to be a weighty decision. I yeah. Think. You've but got two fabulous options. Pick a fabulous option, you know. In lung cancer, where there are more targets and... Um, you know, with Ross and ALK and so forth, um, those patients were excluded from the immunotherapy study. So we really don't, I think, you know, we really don't have a data-driven answer that one's better than the other. So use practical, you know, knowledge in terms of, you know, side effect profile, cost, financial toxicity is very important, all those things. Um, and then um, how, you know, so in terms of managing toxicity, we talked earlier about um, some of the toxicities that can occur. Um, I, two questions. One is, are there any absolute contraindications to immunotherapy? Um, and, and maybe we could address that first. Go ahead. So transplant, so a patient with a transplanted organ, although there are clinical trials that are presently about to start or might even be active that are thinking about giving immunotherapy to people with transplants, but there were, have been a couple of um, studies that have been reported, or uh, cases that have been reported of people who lose their transplant, um, if they, uh, especially for kidney transplants. Um, and, but, and then there is an ongoing national clinical trial um, that is taking patients that has a bucket for Crohn's disease and a bucket for rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, and so, and those are people who have had more active disease. I think, Wells, you made this point before that sometimes people will have this random diagnosis and it was 15, 20 years ago. Um, and so yeah. those are not, those patients should not get deprived, especially if they're MSI high, should not be deprived of immunotherapy benefit. Perfect. Um, so I think we're just about done. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, and seeing none, I'd like to thank you very much for staying to the end. I think this was a, this was a great thing for me. And you know, yeah. my, thank you, Dr. Messerschmidt and Dr. Azad. This was fantastic. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerviewcom forward slash bju860. This activity is supported through educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb and Merkin Company Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.